Hi there, and welcome to A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. This is a video series where we will explain the massive conspiracies going on in A Song of Ice and Fire. We'll condense every chapter into digestible 15 minute videos released every Wednesday. So to begin, let's start with the prologue of A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,808 words long, and is told from the perspective of Will, who has been a veteran of the Night's Watch for over four years. Will, Garrod, and Sir Waymar Royce are in the Haunted Forest, tracking a group of widling raiders beyond the wall. Each of these rangers are important, so we'll go over them quickly. Will had been a poacher before joining the Night's Watch, hunting in House Malister's woods. After Lord Malister's free riders caught him skinning a buck, Will chose to take the black rather than lose a hand. Garrod is past 50, he has lost both ears, three toes, and a finger. Old and scrawny, Garrod joined the Night's Watch as a boy, and is considered an experienced ranger by Mormont. The final ranger is the arrogant Waymar Royce. As a third son of a lord, Waymar had few chances at wealth or land, and so joined the Night's Watch. He was escorted by his father, Lord Yon Royce, north to the Wall. While they stayed at Winterfell as guests on the way, Sansa Stark fell wildly in love with Waymar. However, among the brothers of the Night's Watch, Waymar's behaviour and appearance earned him some ridicule, behind his back, including from Garrod and Will. Shortly before A Song of Ice and Fire begins, Lord Commander Jor Mormont gave Waymar Royce the command of arranging in search of a band of wildling raiders. He was accompanied by Garrod and Will. Waymar was the least experienced of the three, having been in the Night's Watch for less than half a year whereas Jor counted Garrod and Will among his best men. However, Waymar felt it was his due to have a command, because he was a knight and Jor accepted, since he did not want to offend Waymar's father. On the ninth day of ranging north and northeast through the haunted forest, the three men discussed what to do. Will has reported on eight immobile wildlings that he found, claiming they are all dead. Meanwhile, Garrod is uneasy and insists that they turn back to the wall, since they have eight or nine days of travel ahead of them which can turn into a fortnight if it snows. Waymar, however, has the command, and after making light of Garrod's fears, asks Will again for the details of what he saw. Will explains that he saw the wildlings' encampment, their lean-to structure was covered by snow, they had no fire, and none of the wildlings moved the entire time he was watching. They were lying on the ground as if dead, but no blood was visible. Waymar suggests they might have been sleeping, but Will insists they are dead. There was also a woman up in a tree, but she did not move either. Garrod suggests the wildlings must have been killed by the cold, but Waymar points out that the weather has not been cold enough to freeze men like that, especially not wildlings. He orders Will to lead them to the dead wildlings. With night falling, the rangers ride back to the wildling camp. Both Will and Garrod sense something is wrong, but Waymar mocks them and commands Garrod to stay behind and guard the horses. Garrod intends to make a fire, arguing that fire can keep some enemies away. But Waymar calls him a fool and orders him not to. Will fears that Waymar's insolence will provoke Garrod into drawing his sword, but Garrod acquiesces and no fire is lit. Will and Waymar climb up the ridge. Waymar is much noisier than Will. When Will reaches his previous vantage point, he sees that the bodies are gone. Waymar, walking upright, reaches the top of the ridge and stands in plain sight. Will warns Waymar to get down. But Waymar just laughs, determined to find the wildlings and make his first ranging a success. Waymar orders Will to climb a tree and look for a fire. Will reluctantly climbs a nearby sentinel tree. Below him, Waymar challenges an unseen foe. Will thinks he sees a white shadow moving below, but is not sure. He's about to call down a warning, but stops, unsure. Waymar calls to Will with unease in his voice as he turns in a circle with his sword drawn and asks about the sudden cold, which Will also feels an other emerges from the woods, tall, gaunt, and white, dappled with a grey-green shimmer. Waymar nervously commands it to come no further, and prepares himself for battle, challenging the other to dance with him. Will notes that Waymar, in that moment, is no longer a boy, but truly a man of the Night's Watch. When more others appear among the trees, Will considers calling out a warning, but decides not to do so, as it would require him to reveal his position. The sword of the first other is made of translucent crystal. Waymar is able to check the oncoming blows, until his parry comes a bit too late, and the other's sword cuts through the mail under his arm. Waymar is bleeding heavily, and the other's voice is like cracking ice. The words are mocking. Waymar does not go quietly and screams, For Robert! But his blade strikes the other's sword, where it shatters. We should pause here and acknowledge that A Song of Ice and Fire is named after Robert Frost's poem, Fire and Ice 
And one of George's previous novels, Dying of the Light, also makes reference to a poem by Dylan Thomas you've heard of. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And this is how Waymar chooses to die, and what George thinks death should be. One of the shards hits Waymar's left eye, and he falls to his knees, blinded. All of the others move in and slash at him mercilessly. Will turns his head away for a long time, before looking back to see that the others are gone. When he finally dares, Will climbs down, examines Royce's body, then picks up the knight's twisted and broken sword. He decides to bring it back to show to their commanders, hoping Garrod is still with the horses. When Will stands up again, Waymar has risen and is standing over him. His remaining eye has turned blue. With an icy cold touch, Waymar's hands go around Will's throat. The prologue ends there, and what's most tragic about it is that Will was planning to return back to the Night's Watch with the evidence to prove that the others have returned, only to be strangled to death before he could do so. And with Robert Baratheon arriving at Winterfell, the timing couldn't have been better for Westeros. But instead, internal squabbles like the War of the Five Kings exhaust the Seven Kingdoms' resources, while the real threat lingers in the North, waiting for winter to come. Now, there's a lot of theories surrounding the others, and there is what the show presented us with, which is that the others were created by the children of the forest to take revenge on the first men of Westeros for taking all the land that once belonged to them. However, until this is confirmed in the books, we'll move on. Next, it is suspected that by fellow theorists like Preston Jacobs, that the others' migration south is out of necessity, for the Night's Watch have forgotten about their ancient practice of hand-delivering newborn babies to the others in an agreement that was made 8,000 years ago. It's theorized that the others cannot or struggle to procreate. So they constantly require new genetic makeup. Otherwise they become too incestuous and deformed, which means that Craster giving his incest ridden maleborns to the others in a clash of kings is only exasperating their inbred depression, which is a real thing. So it could be that the others are justified in their invasion since the Night's Watch have failed to keep their side of the promise made 8,000 years ago after the long night. Anyway, we should get a better look at the others when The Winds of Winter hopefully gets released. In the meantime, that's about it for the prologue chapter. In the next video, we'll cover Bran 1 and go from there. In the meantime, here are some of the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the book, the White Walkers attack happens after several days of riding north of the Wall, but in the TV series, it happens in a forest close to the Wall, on the same day the Rangers leave Castle Black. The White Walkers are mostly called Others in the books, especially by the people of the Seven Kingdoms. It is the Wildlings and Old Nan who refer to them as White Walkers. In the TV series, Will discovers the Wildlings massacred and their bodies brutalized. In the book, he says they appear to be sleeping and likely froze to death. There is no mentioning in the book that the Wildlings' corpses have been arranged in any pattern. The White Walkers are of different appearance in the TV series. In the book, they have white skin and reflective light armor. In the TV series, they have frozen grey skin and brutal faces, similar to a skull, and the armour they wear in later seasons is black and non-reflective. The white girl who frightens Will in the series is never mentioned in the book. In the book, Waymar Royce is transformed into a white. In the TV series, Garrod is killed by the White Walkers, and Will escapes. In the books, Will is strangled by the white of Waymar Royce, and Garrod escapes to be executed in Bran 1. So let's continue on with Bran 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,016 words long, and is told from the perspective of Bran, the second youngest son of Lord Eddard Stark and Lady Caitlin. In this chapter, Bran is made to watch an execution when his father dispenses justice to a Night's Watch deserter. When they're on their way back to Winterfell, Jon Snow and Robb Stark find six orphan direwolf pups. This chapter foreshadows some interesting conspiracies, but we'll get into that later in the video. In the ninth year of summer, seven-year-old Bran Stark is traveling with a party of 20 men, including his father, to see the king's justice done. This is the first time Bran has been allowed to join. His older brother Rob thinks the man to be executed must be sworn to Man's Radar, the king beyond the wall, which makes Bran think of old Nan's tales about the wildlings. The offender turns out to be an old man, dressed in the ragged blacks of the Night's Watch, who has lost his ears and a finger to frostbite. We all know this man to be Garrod from the prologue chapter, However, exactly how he got so far south of the Wall remains a mystery. It is unlikely that he could have escaped past Mormont at Castle Black or Eastwatch, 
but we'll talk about this later. Lord Eddard questions Garrod briefly. Then two guardsmen drag Garrod to the stump of a werewood, and Theon Greyjoy brings Eddard his Valyrian steel sword, Ice. Theon is both a ward and hostage of the Iron Throne, and House Stark after the failed Greyjoy Rebellion in 289. Eddard pronounces Garrod's sentence to be death, and raises the blade. Jon Snow, Bran's bastard brother, reminds him not to look away, and so Bran watches as his father strikes off the man's head with a single stroke. The head lands near Theon, who laughs and kicks it away. Jon calls Theon an ass under his breath, and compliments Bran on his pose during the execution. On the way back to Winterfell, Rob and Jon argue about whether or not the deserter died bravely before racing their horses to the bridge, leaving Bran behind. Eddard rides up and asks if Bran knows why he executed the man himself. Bran replies that the man was a wildling. Eddard corrects him and says that the man was a deserter. Then explains the first men whom the Starks are descended from believe that the man who passes the sentence should wield the sword and perform the execution himself, lest he become too comfortable with ordering deaths and the Starks still hold to that principle. We also get one of the best lines from both the book and show, Bran thought about it. Can a man still be brave if he's afraid? That is the only time a man can be brave, his father told him. We'll be quoting from the book directly sometimes in these videos. John calls from up ahead for them to see what he and Rob have found. They find Rob holding something in his arms, next to the corpse of a wolf larger than Bran's pony. John correctly identifies the corpse as a direwolf. Theon comments that direwolves have not been seen south of the wall for 200 years. Bran then notices that Rob is cradling a small pup and gives it a stroke after Rob reassures him. John gives Bran another pup. When they inspect the mother's corpse, they find a large piece of shattered antler lodged in her throat. The soldiers in the company feel this to be a bad omen. Theon offers to kill the pups, but Bran protests. Eddard initially states killing them would be best, but then Jon Snow interjects. Lord Stark. John said. It was strange to hear him call father that, so formal. Bran looked at him with desperate hope. There are five pups, he told father. Three male, two female. What of it, John? You have five trueborn children, John said. Three sons, two daughters. The dire wolf is the sigil of your house. Your children were meant to have these pups, my lord. Bran saw his father's face change. The other men exchanged glances. He loved John with all his heart at that moment. Even at seven, Bran understood what his brother had done. The count had come right only because John had omitted himself. He had included the girls, included even Rickon, but not the bastard who bore the surname Snow. This is one of our favourite John moments, so we thought to include it. Rob and Bran both declare that they are willing to nurse their pups. Eddard stresses that the children must feed and raise the pups themselves, not pass them off to the servants. Must treat the direwolves well, lest they become dangerous, and bury them should they die, which is a show-only inclusion. Both Rob and Bran state they will not allow the pups to die. As they begin to ride away, Jon hears a noise, and goes back to discover a sixth pup, an albino with red eyes, that had crawled away from its mother. Bran finds it curious that it is the only pup that has opened its eyes. Theon claims that the albino will die quicker than the others, but Jon disagrees, claiming it for himself. And this is where Bran won A Game of Thrones ends. Now, there is the mystery of who sent the direwolves. It is theorised that Bloodraven might have sent them to unlock the Stark children's warging abilities, since, as you'll see, the direwolves greatly influence both the story and the Stark children. For example, Greywind wins Rob the battle at Oxcross. Summer saves Bran multiple times and awakens his third eye. Both Arya and Jon Snow have wolf dreams that influence them. Shaggy Dog is the proof that Rickon is the trueborn heir to Winterfell, and Lady's death helps awaken Sansa to the savagery at court. The mother direwolf, killed by a shattered antler, convinces Caitlyn to send her children away. All in all, the arrival of the direwolves heralded great change and potentially allows a powerful skin changer like Bloodraven to influence the Stark children through their pets. We believe the sight of ice uses animals to influence events like walking a boar to kill Robert at the right time, Mormon's raven helping John win the Lord Commander election, Ghost finding the dead rangers which then cross the wall and become whites, spurring the disastrous great ranging. Meanwhile, the sight of fire uses glass candles, which are introduced in A Dance of Dragons to influence people's dreams. However, one really scary thought is that the pet direwolves have been controlled by Blood Raven this whole time. May I touch your wolf? The thought made John uneasy. Best not. He will not harm me. 
You call him Ghost, yes? Yes, but Ghost... Melisandre made the word a song. The direwolf padded toward her. Wary, he stalked about her, in a circle, sniffing. When she held out her hand, he smelled that too, then shoved his nose against her fingers. John let out a white breath. He is not always so... Warm? Warmth calls to warmth, the Jon Snow. Her eyes were two red stars, shining in the dark. At her throat, her ruby gleamed, a third eye glowing brighter than the others. John had seen Ghost's eyes blazing red the same way, when they caught the light just right. Ghost, he called, to me. The direwolf looked at him as if he were a stranger. John frowned in disbelief. That's queer. So, this right now could suggest the powers of ice are forcing the direwolves to obey the Stark children, and Melisandre's fire magic repelled the spell Ghost was under. Lastly, the execution of Garrod foreshadows that the old gods prefer to receive human sacrifice through werewood stumps, because as we know in Bran 3, A Dance of Dragons, Bran and Bloodraven devour this blood to make themselves stronger. In A Dance of Dragons, Melisandre calls Bran and Bloodraven the champions of the old gods, the eternal enemy. The wooden man she had glimpsed, and the boy with the wolf's face, they were his servants, surely his champions, as Stannis was hers. So, it seems many characters in A Song of Ice and Fire believe there is going to be a battle between fire and ice. Or, that is what George wants us and his characters to believe is going to happen. Lastly, how did the pregnant direwolf and Garrod get south of the wall? It has been theorised that the Black Gate could have been used, but who opened it for them? Since it can only be opened by a member of the Night's Watch, reciting their vows similar to what Sam did in A Storm of Swords. Anyway. We should find out more in the Winds of Winter. And that's about it for Bran 1, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Caitlyn 1 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the other differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the show, Will is the deserter being executed, not Garrod. In the book, Garrod is dead with fear and gives no final words. Will tries to warn House Stark about the White Walkers before calling himself a coward and asking word be sent to his family. Everyone looks on solemnly at this, not sure what to make of his claim about the White Walkers. It should also be mentioned that many scenes from the books have characters sitting atop horses, while in the TV series they are just standing around, since it was easier to film the scenes that way. But a clear distinction between nobility and peasantry is that nobility rarely go outside without riding horses. In the book, Garrod's last words are not mentioned. Moreover, Ned does not discuss with Bran what the deserter said. In the next chapter, Ned tells Caelan that the deserter was half mad. Something had put a fear in him so deep, no one could reach him. The Winterfell soldier's capture of Will is not described in the book. There are several additional scenes in the TV series taking place in Winterfell, which introduce the Stark family. Bran is shown practicing archery while his father is watching him. The scene with needlework, which involves Sansa and Arya, comes from Arya 1 and takes place after King Robert's arrival. Arya is also shown to be an accurate archer, while in the books she doesn't know how to fire a bow and wishes she could learn. Arya has not shot a single arrow in any of the books. In the book, Theon kicks the severed head of the executed deserter and laughs. This action disgusts Jon Snow, who dislikes Theon and vice versa. In the show, Theon does not kick the severed head of the deserter, and he is shown to be on good terms with Jon before they part ways. In the book, between the execution of the deserter and the discovery of the direwolf pups, Rob and John have a riding race. This is omitted in the show. Events of the TV series are 17 years after Robert's Rebellion, while in the book they are only 14 years. Thus, the Stark children are each about 3 years older than their ages in the book. Rob and John are 17 instead of 14 turning 15. Bran is 10 instead of 7 and Rickon's age is increased from 3 to 6. The Stark's girls' birth years are altered. Sansa is 13 instead of 11, turning 12, and Arya is 11 instead of 9. Likewise, the royal children are older. Joffrey is 16 instead of 12, Marcella is 11 instead of 8, and Tommen is 10 instead of 7. Daenerys is 16 instead of 13, turning 14. In the book, snow covers the ground around Winterfell, and the pups are found waist-deep in snow. In the TV series, there is no snow. In the book, the Starks do not find a stag nor any other animal except the direwolf and its puppies. So, let's continue on with Caitlin 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 2,065 words long, 
and is told from the perspective of Caitlin, the wife of Lord Eddard Stark and daughter of Holster Tully. In this chapter, Caitlin seeks out her husband in the Godswood to inform him of the news that his foster father, Lord John Arryn, the Hand of the King, is dead, and that King Robert Baratheon, his family, and half his court are on their way to Winterfell. This chapter is mostly plot heavy and explains the Godswood, the differences between the Faith of the Seven in the South and the Old Gods of the North, Ned's Valerian steel sword ice, how uncomfortable the Winterfell Godswood makes Caitlin feel, and the Weirwoods, which we'll talk about later in the video. We also learn that Caitlin's sister is married to Ned's foster father, Caitlin's uncle, Brynden Tully, resides at the Eyrie, and that Queen Cersei's pride grows with every year. So really, not a lot happens in this chapter, except for the letter. But George is planting the seeds for the mystery surrounding John Arryn's poisoning, the Stark-Lannister rivalry, Mance Radar, and the different religions of Westeros. In this chapter, Caitlin seeks out her husband, Eddard, in the Godswood, following his return to Winterfell after the events of Bran 1. She knows her husband always goes there after executing a man. Caitlin finds the Godswood very dark and unsettling, compared to the sunny Godswood she remembers from River Run, her childhood home, and the seat of House Tully. Unlike her own family, the Starks keep faith with the Old Gods, rather than the faith of the Seven adopted by the rest of Westeros. She finds Ned polishing his ancestral greatsword, Ice, under the heart tree at the center of the grove. He asks after the children, and Caitlin tells him they are deciding on the names for their new wolves. Ned notes that the man he executed is the fourth deserter this year. He adds that the man was half mad, that something had put a fear into him so deep that he could not reach him. The Night's Watch is dwindling, down to less than a thousand men. Not just from deserters, but from ranging casualties. One day, Ned may have to call his banners to fight Man's Raider himself. Caitlin warns him that there are darker things beyond the wall. Ned replies that the others have been dead for 8,000 years, and that Maester Lewin claims they never existed at all. Caitlin replies that nobody had seen direwolves until today. When Ned asks why Caitlin has come, she tells him that John Arryn, his foster father, and her brother-in-law is dead. The news came in King Robert's own hand. When asked, Caitlin explains that John Arryn's widow, Caitlin's sister, Lysa, and her son have returned to the Eyrie and says that she thinks her sister should not be alone and should have gone back to Riverrun. Ned urges Caitlin to take the children to keep her sister company, but then Caitlin informs him that Robert Baratheon has also written to say he is coming to Winterfell. This news cheers up Ned. It has been nine years since he last saw his old friend. However, Caitlin is worried about the omen of a direwolf found dead in the snow with an antler buried in its throat. Robert is coming here? When she nodded, a smile broke across his face. Caitlin wished she could share his joy, but she had heard the talk in the yards, a dire wolf dead in the snow, a broken antler in its throat, dread coiled within her like a snake. But she forced herself to smile at this man she loved, this man who put no faith in signs. Here, we see that the death of the dire wolf mum stokes fear in Caitlin, and this, along with potential glass candle dreams, motivates Caitlin to take a series of actions that both benefit the side of fire with the return of Jaime Lannister to King's Landing, and the side of ice with Caitlin leaving Winterfell, seizing Tyrion, and igniting the War of the Five Kings. Thus, Bran can go north. With Robert coming, Caitlin confirms with Ned that they should send word to his brother Benjen on the wall. Then Caitlin informs Ned that Robert's wife, Cersei Lannister, their children, and her Lannister brothers are also coming. Ned does not like the Lannisters, because they came to Robert's cause only after victory was certain. Eddard is looking forward to seeing Robert and Cersei's children, and then announces his worry about feeding them all, cursing his old friend. And this is where Caitlin 1, A Game of Thrones, ends. There is not much to discuss in way of conspiracies with this chapter. However, this chapter does seem to connect with the events in Bran 3, A Dance with Dragons. It is time, Lord Brynden said. Something in his voice sent icy fingers running up Bran's neck. Time for what? For the next step. For you to go beyond skin changing and learn what it means to be a green seer. Inside was a white paste, thick and heavy, with dark red veins running through it. You must eat this, said Leaf. She handed Bran a wooden spoon. The boy looked at the bowl uncertainly. What is it? A paste of weirwood seeds. Something about the look of it made Bran feel ill. The red veins were only weirwood sap, he supposed, but in the torchlight they looked remarkably like blood. He dipped the spoon into the paste, then hesitated. 
This piece might be Jojen. Will this make me a green seer? Your blood makes you a green seer, said Lord Brynden. This will help awaken your gifts and wed you to the trees. Bran did not want to be married to a tree, but who else would wed a broken boy like him? A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees, a green seer. He ate. It had a bitter taste, though not so bitter as acorn paste. The first spoonful was the hardest to get down. He almost retched it right back up. The second tasted better. The third was almost sweet. The rest he spooned up eagerly. Why had he thought that it was bitter? It tasted of honey, of new fallen snow, of pepper and cinnamon, and the last kiss his mother ever gave him. The empty bowl slipped from his fingers and clattered on the cabin floor. I don't feel any different. What happens next? Leaf touched his hand. The trees will teach you. The trees remember. He raised a hand, and the other singers began to move about the cavern, extinguishing the torches one by one. The darkness thickened and crept toward them. Close your eyes, said the three-eyed crow. Slip your skin, as you do when you join with summer, but this time, go into the roots instead. Follow them up through the earth, to the trees upon the hill, and tell me what you see. Bran closed his eyes and slipped free of his skin, into the roots, he thought, into the weirwood. For an instant, he could hear the river rushing by below. Then, all at once, he was back home again. Lord Eddard Stark sat upon a rock beside the deep black pool in the godswood. The pale roots of the heart tree twisted around him. The great sword ice lay across Lord Eddard's lap, and he was cleaning the blade with an oilcloth. Winterfell, Bran whispered. His father looked up. Who's there? He asked, turning. And Bran, frightened, pulled away. His father and the black pool and the godswood faded and were gone. And he was back in the cavern, the pale thick roots of his weirwood throne, cradling his limbs as a mother does a child. A torch flared to life before him. Tell us what you saw. So it seems as though Bran visited Ned just before the events of Caitlin 1. This, along with the Hodor reveal from Season 6, Episode 5, seem to confirm that Bran can use the weirwood net to influence the past. However, this is pure speculation, and plenty of people don't agree with it. Anyway, we should find out more in The Winds of Winter. And that's about it for Caitlin 1, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we will cover Daenerys 1 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the other differences between the HBO TV show and book. The scene in King's Landing introducing Queen Cersei and her brother Jaime is not in the books. It also shows the corpse of John Arryn. In the book, the conversation between Jaime and Cersei about John Arryn's death and their secrets occur when Bran discovers them having sex at Winterfell in Bran 2, A Game of Thrones. There is no mention in the novels that Jaime ever jumped off the cliffs of Castle Rock. In the books, the conversation between Ned and Caitlin about Mance Raider is omitted, and so is the situation at the Wall, where Ned remarks that he might need to call his banners and march north of the Wall to defeat Mance Raider in battle. Moreover, the news that Lysa has gone to the Eyrie is introduced later in the show. Everything else that is omitted from the book includes Caitlin remarking that Lysa should have gone to Riverrun instead of the Eyrie to be with family. Ned informing us that Brendan Tully is at the Eyrie and will be able to give Lysa comfort. Ned's suggestion Caitlin should take the children and visit Lysa. Lastly, in the book, Ned is way happier to hear that Robert is traveling to Winterfell, while in the show, he looks miserable. So let's continue on with Daenerys 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 4,185 words long and is told from the perspective of Daenerys Stormborn, the daughter of Ares. But fans speculate this might not be true. In this chapter, the exiled princess Daenerys Targaryen prepares to be presented to Khal Drogo, a Dothraki horse lord, as her brother, the self-proclaimed King Viserys, hopes to gain a Dothraki army in exchange for his sister. This chapter foreshadows a lot of conspiracies and mysteries, such as the House with the Red Door, Ilaroi Mopatis, and more. But we'll get into that later. The chapter starts with Viserys presenting Daenerys with a gift from Magister Ilaroi. For the past half year, the exiled king Viserys Targaryen and his 13-year-old sister Daenerys have been residing in the house of Ilaroi Mopatis, a magister of Pentos. The gift being presented is a fine gown made of silk. Daenerys has to look like the princess she is, so Khal Drogo will ask for her hand in marriage. Although Daenerys is doubtful of Ilaroi's motives, Viserys insists that the magister simply wants to earn his good graces. 
Afraid of angering her brother, which he calls waking the dragon, Daenerys keeps silent about her mistrust. Viserys warns Daenerys not to fail him, and twists one of her nipples to emphasize his threat. According to Viserys, when the history of his reign is written, it will be said that his reign began this night. Viserys departs, leaving Daenerys alone with her thoughts. She dreads the feast she has to attend that evening, and her mind wanders to Westeros, the homeland she has never seen. Daenerys had been conceived shortly before her mother, Queen Rayla Targaryen, fled King's Landing with Viserys, and born nine months later on Dragonstone. All she knows of her early life comes from Viserys. The flight from King's Landing to Dragonstone, her eldest brother, Rhaegar Targaryen fighting Robert Baratheon and dying, the sack of King's Landing, the gruesome death of Prince Aegon, and the murder of her father, King Ares, in the throne room, committed by a knight of his own Kingsguard. Nine months after the deaths of her brother and father, Daenerys' mother died giving birth to her, something for which Viserys has never forgiven her. And during a summer storm which destroyed most of the Targaryen fleet, which had been Dragonstone's last defense, when the garrison of Dragonstone was about to give Viserys and Daenerys over to Stannis Baratheon, who was on his way to take the island fortress, Sir Willem Derry and four loyal men secretly took them to Braavos. There they lived in a big house with a red door and a lemon tree outside her window. However, as we'll get into later, lemon trees don't grow in Braavos. After Viserys and Daenerys were put out of the house, they began to travel from city to city, never staying anywhere long. As Viserys feared the usurper's assassins were right behind them. Daenerys recalls how rich merchants, archons, and magisters became less willing to host the Targaryens as the years went by, and how Viserys had been forced to sell their mother's crown. However, Despite the lack of support, Viserys has become obsessed with recovering the Iron Throne. Daenerys knows that he is called the Beggar King behind his back, and wonders if he will have given her a nickname too. Illaroy's servants come to bathe her, and prepare Daenerys for the feast at Khal Drogo's manse, where she is to meet and impress the Khal who was marrying her for her Targaryen blood. The servants tell her how lucky she is to marry a man so rich that even his slaves wear golden collars. Once she is properly dressed, her brother returns with Illaroy and commands her to stand up and turn around. Illaroy showers Daenerys with compliments, while Viserys complains that she is too skinny and too young. Illaroy reassures him that she is old enough for the cow and comments on her silver gold hair and purple eyes, the hallmarks of old Valyrian nobility. Viserys states that barbarians are said to have queer tastes such as boys and sheep. Illaroy warns him not to say these things to Khal Drogo, creating a flare of anger in Viserys' eyes. Do you take me for a fool? The Magister bowed slightly. I take you for a king. Kings lack the caution of common men. My apologies if I have given offence. Later that night, the three of them journey in Illaroy's litter to Khal Drogo's manse. Viserys states that 10,000 Dothraki screamers will be enough to overthrow the usurper when combined with those in Westeros that are awaiting his return. He speculates on those who would join their cause, House Tyrell, House Redwyn, House Darry, House Greyjoy, and the Dornishmen. Illaroy assures Viserys that the people in the Seven Kingdoms secretly await his return. Though Daenerys doubts him, Danny had no agents, no way of knowing what anyone was doing or thinking across the Narrow Sea. But she mistrusted Illaroy's sweet words, as she mistrusted everything about him. Her brother was nodding eagerly, however, I shall kill the usurper myself, he promised, who had never killed anyone, as he killed my brother Rhaegar, and Lannister too, the Kingslayer, for what he did to my father. That would be most fitting, Magister Illaroy said. Danny saw the smallest hint of a smile playing around his full lips, but her brother did not notice. So this smile seems to suggest that Illaroy never believed Viserys had any chance of retaking the Seven Kingdoms and was always a Fagon supporter, as was revealed to the reader in A Dance with Dragons, which we'll get into later and explain further in another video. Illaroy says Drogo's mansion was a gift from the Magisters of Pentos to help win Drogo's friendship they arrive at the mansion and are announced as King Viserys III and Princess Daenerys. Illaroy points out several guests, including Sir Jorah Mormont, who had fled Westeros under sentence of death years earlier, and has since spent much time among the Dothraki. Illaroy then points out Khal Drogo himself, who was graceful as a panther and younger than Daenerys had expected. Viserys notes his long braid. When Dothraki are defeated, they must cut their hair, but Drogo has never been defeated. Daenerys only notes his cold, hard face and is afraid of him. She asks to go home, provoking a rant from Viserys. 
about how their home was taken away from them. Daenerys only meant their rooms in Ilaroy's estate, but none of the places they have stayed in have been Viserys' home. He assures Daenerys that he would let Khal Drogo's whole Khalasar, including their horses, rape her if it would win him back the Iron Throne. He then tells her to stop crying, because Ilaroy is leading Khal Drogo over to meet them. Daenerys stops crying, stands up straight, and smiles. And this is where Daenerys 1, A Game of Thrones, ends. Now, it has been theorised and confirmed by George himself that Daenerys' memories of the House of the Red Door are either partially false or completely fabricated since it has been proven beyond a doubt that lemons do not grow in Bravos. The first evidence for Daenerys' memories being a lie comes from Arya 2, A Storm of Swords, when the innkeeper's wife says, Lemons? And where would we get lemons? Does this look like dawn to you, you freckled fool? So, looking at a map, lemons can only grow in arid climates, and if the Riverlands are north of Dawn and cannot grow lemons, then there is no way that lemons could grow in Bravos, which is described as having cold and miserable weather. However, the conclusive proof comes from the Mercy Sample Chapter, where Arya overhears a Lannister guard complain about the Bravosi weather. Seven hells, this place is damp, she heard her guard complain. I'm chilled to the bones. Where are the bloody orange trees? I always heard there were orange trees in the free cities. Lemons and limes. Where are the bare-bellied girls, I ask you? Down in Lice and Myra. And old Volantis, the other guard replied. He was an older man, big-bellied and grizzled. I went to Lice with Lord Tywin once, when he was the hand to Ares. Bravos is north of King's Landing, fool. Can't you read a bloody map? Anyway, this seems to prove that lemons don't grow in Bravos, and this mystery should hopefully be resolved in the next book. And that's about it for Daenerys 1, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Eddard 1 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the other differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the book, Daenerys is introduced after Ned gets the news about Jon Arryn's death. In the TV series, she appears after the scene at Lyanna Stark's tomb. Targaryens have violet eyes in the book, but this trait was dropped from the series. The showrunners have said that they did use purple contacts early in filming, but this interfered with the actors' performances, so it was dropped. Illeroy's appearance is different from his description in the books. In the show, Illeroy is overweight and has dark brown hair. Meanwhile, in the books, Illeroy is morbidly obese, with gold oiled hair and a forked yellow beard. Khal Drogo's appearance is also slightly different. In the books, he has long mustachio with rings in them and many bells in his long braid. In the show, he has a beard with a single ring and no bells in his hair. In the book, Daenerys, Viserys, and Illeroy go to Drogo's manse and attend a party to celebrate Drogo and Daenerys' engagement. Many important people appear in this party, including guests from other free cities. Several other cows, sell swords from Pentos, Mia, and Tyrosh, a red priest even fatter than Illeroy, hairy men from the port of Ibn, and lords from the Summer Isle. Jorah Mormont is first seen at this party, but does not speak. What is also really cool is that Illeroy has invited a red priestess, which foreshadows Illeroy's plan of using the R'hllor followers in Volantis to support Daenerys and by extension Aegon in a dance with dragons, which is some great foreshadowing. In the show, Drogo simply rides up to Illeroy's manse with his blood riders to assess Daenerys before their wedding. So let's continue on with Eddard 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,794 words long and is told from the perspective of Eddard Stark, the son of Rickon Stark and younger brother to Brandon Stark. In this chapter, King Robert Baratheon arrives at Winterfell with his party, where he offers Lord Eddard Stark the position of Hand of the King, and proposes a betrothal between Eddard's daughter, Sansa, and his own son, Prince Joffrey. This chapter introduces King Robert and the Lannisters, Ned's relationship with Robert, the crypts of Winterfell, the history of Robert's rebellion, and the mystery surrounding Lyanna Stark's final words, Promise me, Ned. The King's party, 300 strong, rides into Winterfell. Eddard recognises Sir Jaime Lannister, Tyrion Lannister, Prince Joffrey Baratheon, and Sandor Clegane, but does not recognise his old friend, King Robert, until Robert calls out. Eddard is shocked to see that Robert has gained 8 stone, 112 pounds, since they last saw each other, 9 years ago, during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Eddard pays respect to Queen Cersei and the younger children. No sooner had those formalities of greetings been completed, the king said to his host, Take me down to your crypt, Eddard. I would pay my respects. Ned loved him for that, for remembering her still, after all these years. 
Queen Cersei objects, but is completely disregarded by Robert, and quietly led away by Jaime. Ned asks Robert about his journey, and Robert complains of the distance that had to be travelled, and the vast emptiness of the north. Robert then describes the advantages of living in the south, telling Ned the wonders he must see. The food, the flowers, the wine, and the women. However, Ned sees the toll these pleasures have had as they descend into the crypts, which is difficult for the out-of-shape Robert. They pass the dead of House Stark with statues in front of the tombs, each lord holding a sword on his lap with a direwolf at his feet. They arrive at the last of the occupied crypts. Here, there are three tombs for Ned's father Rickard, his eldest brother Brandon, and his sister Lyanna. Robert declares Ned should have buried Lyanna on a sunny hillside, but Ned explains that she was a Stark of Winterfell and belongs here, as was her wish. Ned remembers her dying. I was with her when she died, Ned reminded the king. She wanted to come home, to rest beside Brandon and father. He could hear her still at times. Promise me, she had cried. In a room that smelled of blood and roses. Promise me, Ned. Her fingers had clutched his as she gave up her hold on life. The rose petals spilling from her palm, dead and black. After that, he remembered nothing. They had found him still holding her body, silent with grief. The little Kragen man, Helen Reed, had taken her hand from his. Ned could recall none of it. I bring her flowers when I can. So, it seems pretty obvious that Lyanna died in childbirth, but there might be more to this mystery than what the show presents us with. Robert recalls taking his vengeance on Rhaegar for what he did to Lyanna, and regretting that he only got to kill him once, and reveals that he dreams about him every night. Ned suggests that they return to the surface where Robert's wife will be waiting. Robert replies that the others can take his wife, but they start back all the same. As they return, Ned asks about John Aaron, and Robert declares that he has never seen a man die so quickly, from healthy to dead within a fortnight. Ned asks how John's widow, Lysa, is bearing her grief, explaining that Caitlin fears for her sister. Robert confides that he thinks John's death has driven Lysa mad and that she has taken her son back to the Eyrie. Robert had hoped to foster the sickly boy with Tywin Lannister, but Lysa refused to hear of it and left in the dead of night. Cersei was furious. Ned, who does not trust Tywin, is relieved. Ned asks to foster Robert Aaron himself, but Tywin's already agreed, and Ned taking him as a ward would be an insult to Tywin. Ned comments that Robert should visit the Wall, but Robert responds that he has more important concerns, such as replacing Lord Aaron, who held several important positions, such as Warden of the East. Ned reminds Robert that the title traditionally goes with the domain of House Aaron, but Robert declares that he would not appoint six-year-old Robert Aaron as Warden of the East. Ned reminds Robert that during times of peace, the title is only an honour. The king is not pleased, the son is not the father, though maybe when the boy is grown, the title will be given back. Robert mentions that he also needs a new hand of the king and offers the position to Ned so they can work together again. Then Robert tells Ned how the responsibilities bore him and complains that he is surrounded by flatterers and fools. He insists that he wants Ned to come south to King's Landing to be hand of the king, the second most powerful man in the realm. Ned does not want the position and tries to declare himself unworthy of the honour. Robert jokes that he is not trying to honour Ned but to get him to run his kingdom for him spouting the low-born saying that the king eats and the hand takes the ship. Robert asks for at least a smile, but Ned replies that it is to be so cold in the north that a man's laughter freezes in his throat and chokes him to death. King Robert then offers to marry his son, Prince Joffrey, to Ned's 11-year-old daughter, Sansa Stark, to join the houses of Stark and Baratheon as he and Lyanna were supposed to. Ned hesitates to make this decision, wishing to speak to his wife, Robert asks him not to take too long. Ned is filled with a sense of foreboding, knowing that Winterfell is where he belongs and that winter is coming. And this is where Eddard 1 A Game of Thrones ends. Now onto the theory portion of the video. It is suspicious that Ned buried Lyanna and Brandon in the crypts of Winterfell because even though Ned tells us that is what Lyanna wanted, statues are only meant for the lords and kings of Winterfell. There are many theories for why Lyanna was buried in the crypts but none of them seem conclusive as to why she was buried there. So if you're interested to see what might have happened at the Tower of Joy, check out Preston Jacobs' video series. Since like Preston, we also believe there was probably a baby swap at the Tower of Joy involving House Dane and the Kingsguard. 
We also believe Mance Raider is secretly Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, since he was able to best Jon Snow in single combat in A Dance with Dragons and knows way too much about Westeros and the Seven Kingdoms for an ordinary turncloak. Here is a video from the Order of the Green Hand that explains this theory in greater detail, if you're interested. But again, this is just speculation. In future videos, we'll come back to the baby swap idea and Man's Radar being Sir Arthur Dane. And that's about it for Eddard 1, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover John 1 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the other differences between the HBO TV show and book. Tyrion's appearance is different to his description in the books. He has stunted legs, a swollen forehead, a squashed in face, and eyes of different colors. He walks with a profound waddle. Unlike in the show, the book does not describe the following scenes. Caitlin and Lewin preparing for the feast. Rob, Theon, and Jon grooming themselves for the arrival of the royal party. Bran sighting the royal party on the top of the wall. Caitlin scolding Bran for climbing up the wall. Arya watching the arrival of the royal party. House Stark and their retainers lining up to greet the royal party. And Arya's whimsy late arrival. In the book, the wheelhouse Cersei and the royal children travel in is huge. As the book goes, it is pulled by 40 heavy draft horses and is too wide to pass through the castle gates. Thus, the queen and children have to debark outside and walk into the castle. In the show, the wheelhouse is much smaller and is pulled by lesser horses into the castle. Tyrion's introduction in the books is different. He is introduced at the feast through the POV of Jon. In the show, he is introduced in a scene with the prostitute Ross after Robert Baratheon's arrival. Ross doesn't exist in the books. In the TV series, she is a recurring character. In the book, Robert does not place a feather in the hand of Lyanna's statue. Lastly, both Tommen and Marcella are presented before the Stark children in the book and vice versa. So let's continue on with John 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,232 words long and is told from the perspective of Jon Snow, the supposed bastard son of Eddard Stark. In this chapter, Jon Snow attends the feast Winterfell is holding for the royal guests and speaks with Benjen Stark about joining the Night's Watch and Tyrion Lannister about being born a bastard. This chapter introduces Jon Snow properly to the reader, his hopes, his dreams, and his insecurities. We see that Jon is more observant than his half-siblings, but really knows nothing, like Tyrion and Benjen try to tell him. A feast is held in Winterfell in honour of King Robert's royal visit. Jon decides that he is thankful his bastardy has relegated him to the far end of the hall with the younger squires, instead of the king's family, where he can drink as much as he wants and mingle freely with those around him. Jon watches the king and his family as they arrive. He recognises Queen Cersei's false smile and is disappointed with fat, red-faced King Robert. Princess Marcella seems smitten with her escort, Rob, leading Jon to decide she is insipid. Arya is escorted by plump, young Prince Tommen. The 12-year-old Crown Prince Joffrey, who is even taller than Rob, is escorting the radiant Sansa. Jon decides he does not like Joffrey's pouty lips or the disdain the prince seems to hold for Winterfell. He also notes that the Queen's brother, Jaime Lannister, looks like a proper king. And the waddling dwarf, Tyrion Lannister, is grotesquely fascinating. As ugly as Jaime and Cersei are beautiful. The last to enter are Benjen Stark and Theon Greyjoy. Jon feeds his direwolf ghost under the table and watches the pup silently face down a full-grown dog three times his size. Bringing his wolf to the feast is another perk to being the bastard. Jon is joined by Benjen, who asks how much he's had to drink, adding that Jon is older than he was when he first got truly drunk. Benjen asks about Ghost, and Jon explains that he named him Ghost for his white colour and because he never makes a sound. Benjen asks why Jon is not at the main table, and Jon says flatly that Lady Caitlin thought seating a bastard with the king might give offence. Benjen comments that Eddard does not seem festive, and Jon adds that neither does the queen probably because of King Robert's visit to the crypts. Benjen commends Jon's keen observation and remarks that he could use a man like him on the wall. Jon latches on to this and asks if he can return to the wall with Benjen. Benjen replies that the wall is a hard place for a boy, but Jon counters that he will turn 15 on his next name day, and it's said bastards grow up faster than purebloods. Jon thinks about how all his half-brothers and sisters have futures, but there is no future for a bastard. Benjen says that he should know a woman and father a bastard or two first, to know what he will be giving up. 
This angers John, who states that he will never father a bastard and runs off with Ghost before anyone can see him cry after knocking into a serving girl. As John is leaving, Tyrion Lannister speaks to him from a ledge in the deserted yard and asks if he can take a look at Ghost. John offers to help him down, but Tyrion jumps down, acrobatically landing on his hands and vaulting to his feet. Ghost is uncertain about Tyrion, but submits to examination at John's command. Tyrion asks if John is Eddard's bastard. John bristles, and Tyrion apologizes that, as a dwarf, he can usually speak as he pleases, like a jester. He comments that John has more of the North in him than his half siblings. John appreciates the comment, but tries not to show it. Let me give you some counts, bastard, Lannister said. Never forget what you are, for surely the world will not. Make it your strength, then it can never be your weakness. John was in no mood for anyone's counsel. What do you know about being a bastard? All dwarfs are bastards in their father's eyes. You are your mother's trueborn son of Lannister. Am I? The dwarf replied, do tell my lord father. My mother died birthing me, and he's never been sure. I don't even know who my mother was, John said. Some woman, no doubt. Most of them are. He favoured John with a rueful grin. Remember this, boy. All dwarfs may be bastards, yet not all bastards need be dwarfs. And this is where John 1 at Game of Thrones ends. Now, onto the theory portion of the video. Why did Maester Lewin lie? So, in the next chapter, Caitlin 2, Ned and Caitlin are discussing what to do with John. When Ned travels south with Robert, Caitlin refuses to house John, but Ned can't take John with him to court. They are at a crossroad. But then, Lewin interjects with this. Another solution presents itself, he said, his voice quiet. Your brother Benjen came to me about John a few days ago. It seems the boy aspires to take the black. Ned looked shocked. He asked to join the Night's Watch. However, as we know, Benjen does not want John to join the Night's Watch so young, and Lewin exploits his position to have John sent to the Wall. For this video series, we'll be pointing out all the times that the Maesters directly or indirectly influence the story, in an effort to prove Maesters sometimes have their own agendas. This will be important later in future theory predictions. Moreover, there is a theory that Benjen was forced to take the Black because he kept something secret from Ned pertaining to Lyanna running away with Rhaegar during Robert's rebellion. Since it is strange for Ned's only remaining brother to be left at the wall, even though there are plenty of better futures he could have chosen from. But again, this is just pure speculation. Although we never see Ned and Benjen interact even once in a Game of Thrones, which could be interpreted that the brothers do not get along despite being pretty honorable guys. And that's about it for John 1, a Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Caitlyn 2 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the other differences between the HBO TV show and book. The entrance of the royal family and House Stark to the feast, described in the book, was omitted in the TV series. In the book, Benjen enters the feast along with the royal family and the other members of House Stark. In the show, he arrives late, after the feast begins, and John doesn't attend the feast at all. John meets his uncle Benjen outside while practicing with a sword. In the book, John attends the feast but is not permitted to sit at the main table with the royal family. Instead, he sits with the squires and other noble-born boys of similar age. But he's actually pleased with this, as out of sight, he is free to drink as much wine as he pleases and gets drunk. Then Benjen approaches him and they have their conversation inside the feasting hall. In the book, the description of the feast is from John's POV, thus it focuses on his conversations with Benjen. The scenes depicting the activities of other people in the feast are mostly not present in the book. These include Robert's activities and Cersei's reactions, conversations between Caitlin and Cersei, conversations between Benjen and Eddard, the subtle confrontation between Jaime and Eddard, Sansa speaking to Cersei, and Arya throwing food at Sansa, etc. So, let's continue on with Caitlin 2, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,495 words long, and is told from the perspective of Caitlin Stark, the daughter of Holster Tully and sister to Lysa Tully. In this chapter, a secret letter from her sister, Lysa, leads Caitlin to convince Ned to go to King's Landing and become the Hand of the King, so he can investigate Jon Arryn's death and see if the Lannisters are involved. This chapter is the first clue that Lysa murdered her husband, since after meeting Lysa, you realise she isn't clever or brave enough to send this letter, and it really could have only been Littlefinger, since it pretty much guaranteed Ned would come to King's Landing. 
Then, Littlefinger's plan is pretty obvious. Get Ned to find out about the incest, and then when he requires the gold cloaks, see what he offers, and then go to Cersei and see what she offers. And whoever makes the better offer is who Peter will side with. Ned and Caitlin are in Caitlin's bedchamber after making love. Uncomfortable with the warmth of the room, which is heated by hot springs beneath the castle, Ned opens the windows. As she watches him from the bed, Caitlin thinks he looks the same as when she married him, and hopes they have conceived another child. The couple discuss King Robert's offer, which Ned intends to refuse. Caitlin insists that he must accept, so as to not offend the king, which might put them all in danger. While Caitlin contemplates the omen of the direwolf killed by a stag, Ned wishes his brother, Brandon, had lived to be the Lord of Winterfell instead. Again, it should be stated how much the dead direwolf mum influenced Caitlin's actions. You knew the man, she said. The king is a stranger to you. Caitlin remembered the direwolf dead in the snow, the broken antler lodged deep in her throat. She had to make him see. They are interrupted by Desmond, who says that Maester Lewin has an urgent message. The Maester is shown in and explains that a carved wooden box containing a brand new glass lens was left in his observatory while he was napping. The way it was delivered made the Maester wonder and he discovered a message hidden beneath a false bottom. Maester Lewin says he's not read it and will not give it to Lord Stark because it is addressed to Caitlin. Caitlin takes the message apprehensively and opens it. Caitlin immediately burns the message after reading it, but explains to Ned that the message was from her sister, Lysa, and written in a secret language only the two sisters share, claiming John Arryn was murdered by Queen Cersei and her family. Your sister is sick with grief. She cannot know what she is saying. She knows, Caitlin said. Lysa is impulsive, yes, but this message was carefully planned, cleverly hidden. She knew it meant death if her letter fell into the wrong hands. To risk so much, she must have had more than mere suspicion. Caitlin looked to her husband. Now we truly have no choice. You must be Robert's hand. You must go south and learn the truth. So it would have been extremely difficult for Lysa in the Eyrie to have sent the letter, leaving only Littlefinger to orchestrate its arrival in Maester Lewin's observatory. Lysa is also too impulsive to come up with such a careful delivery method, and the letter only serves to make sure Eddard has no choice but to accept. Robert's offer to become Hand of the King, and this is what makes A Song of Ice and Fire so great. The mystery that starts it all, the death of John Arryn, can be figured out in the first book alone through the contradicting reports around Robert Arryn's fostering. You can also kind of see how it all played out. Lysa found out that her son was going to be taken away from her, and so Peter convinces her to kill John Arryn and run away with Robin back to the Eyrie and help bring Eddard Stark to King's Landing. It's also a crime how wasted Littlefinger was in the show, when everything he does in the book is so meticulous and chaotic that you're never sure if he planned it or just got really lucky. Either way, Littlefinger is someone to watch out for in the next book. Caitlin maintains that Ned must be the Hand of the King to find the truth behind Lysa's accusations. Maester Lewin agrees with Caitlin, pointing out that the Hand's authority will help determine the truth and protect Lysa and her son. Ned reminds them both that his father went south once at the summons of a king and never returned. Lewin replies that that was a different time and a different king. Caitlin insists that if Ned truly loves King Robert like a brother, he will not leave him to face the Lannisters on his own. Ned then makes his decision. He will go, but Caitlin must stay behind to govern Winterfell and teach his heir Rob how to be a proper lord. He allows that little Rickon may stay with her as well, but the others must come south. Sansa to wed Joffrey and Arya to learn the ways of a southern court. Caitlin reluctantly agrees, but begs that seven-year-old Bran be allowed to stay. Ned insists that Bran must bridge the gap between Rob and Joffrey by befriending Tommen, who is of similar age. Their family will be safer for it, and Caitlin has to agree. Caitlin feels lonely already. Maester Lewin asks about Jon Snow, and Caitlin's anger flashes. She understood Ned fathering a bastard son, but not raising him alongside his true-born children. Also, Caitlin arrived at Winterfell to find Jon and his wet nurse had already taken up residence before her. There were rumours that Ashara Dane was his mother, but Ned has always forbid Caitlin to ask about it, insisting that John was his blood. Ned would never send John away though, 
and Caitlin could never forgive him for that. Caitlin insists that John must leave Winterfell, but Ned argues that there will be no place for John at court. Maester Lewin mentions John's ambition to join the Night's Watch. Ned considers this for a while and finally agrees to let John take the Black, though not until they are ready to leave. For the South, he wants John to enjoy his last few days. Ned decides that when it is time, he will tell John himself. And this is where Caitlin 2, A Game of Thrones ends. Now onto the theory portion of the video. This chapter is a real testament to how George R. R. Martin creates difficult but fair mysteries where the reader has the chance to figure out the answers by carefully examining the text and looking for inconsistencies that George has left behind. So let's continue on with Aria 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 2,699 words long and is told from the perspective of Arya, the daughter of Eddard Stark and Lady Caitlin. In this chapter, Arya runs out on her needlework session to watch the boys practice with swords in the yard with Jon Snow. This chapter is almost entirely omitted from the TV series, but does contain hints of George R.R. R. Martin's original outline for A Game of Thrones where Jon and Arya are in a love triangle. Rob wounds Joffrey on the battlefield before being killed by Jaime and Sansa betraying her family to be with Joffrey. Arya is dismayed at her crooked stitches. She can't match her sister Sansa's needlework. Their governess, Septa Mordain, coos over Princess Marcilla's needlework, which Arya thinks is also crooked. Sansa is whispering with Jean who, and Beth Castle. When Arya asks what they are whispering about, she is told it is about how handsome Prince Joffrey is and how he complimented Sansa and will one day marry her. Arya points out that Jon Snow thinks Joffrey looks like a girl. Sansa laments that Jon gets jealous because he is a bastard, but Arya defends him, drawing the Scepter's attention to her. Scepter Mordain inspects Arya's stitches with everyone watching and pronounces her dissatisfaction. Arya bolts for the door, stopping only long enough to be forced to bow to Princess Marcilla. Humiliated, Arya wishes she had some of her sister's skills and beauty. She has her father's looks not the beauty of their mother like Sansa. Jean used to call her Horseface, which was all the more hurtful because the only thing that Arya could do better than Sansa was ride. That and manage a household since Sansa has no head for figures. Arya finds her direwolf pup Nymeria waiting for her and together they go to watch the boys sparring in the practice yard, not daring to go back to her room where she would be found and punished. On the covered bridge overlooking the yard, Arya comes across Jon Snow seated on a sill with Ghost. Watching the fighting below, she sits down beside him and they watch together. In the yard below, the heavily padded Bran and Prince Tommen are fighting each other with wooden swords under the watchful eye of Sir Roderick Castle, the master at arms. The group of spectators includes Rob and Theon. Arya remembers thinking when she was little that she was a bastard, like Jon, because they were the only children to take after their father. It had been John she had gone to in her fear, and John who had reassured her. When Arya asks why John is not down in the yard with the others, John explains that bastards are not allowed to damage princes. Only true-born swords can do that. Arya says she could fight as well as Bran, who was only seven, while she is nine. But John says she doesn't have enough strength for a longsword. John points out that the newly arrived Prince Joffrey is wearing a sigil that has both the stag and lion on it giving his mother's Lannister sigil equal status to the Royal Baratheon sigil. Jon suggests that Arya should wear a combination sigil for the Starks and Tullys, but Arya jokes that a wolf with a trout in its mouth would look silly. She questions why a girl would need a sigil if she isn't allowed to fight. Jon shrugs that girls get the sigils but not the swords, while bastards get the swords but not the sigils. Below, Bran has knocked Tommen down and Sir Roderick calls Rob and Joffrey for a bout. Joffrey acts as if it is beneath his dignity to fight Starks with practice swords. He suggests real swords and Rob readily accepts. Jon comments to Arya that Joffrey truly is a little shit. So Roderick states that he will only allow blunted tawny swords. Joffrey's scarred bodyguard, Sandor Clegane, remarks that he killed a man with a real sword when he was only 12. Joffrey makes a few more condescending remarks that enrage Rob, then feigns a yawn and leaves with Tommen. John encourages Arya to go to her room and face her punishment. Arya insists it is not fair, but John says that nothing is fair as he walks away with Ghost. Arya returns to her room. 
to find not only Septim Ordain, but also her mother. And this is where Arya 1 A Game of Thrones ends. Now, there really are no major conspiracies being foreshadowed in this chapter, however this chapter might have been written as part of George's 13 chapters from his original outline, as described here in a letter to his bookseller in 1993. We'll only be mentioning the parts relevant to this chapter. Dear Ralph, here are the first 13 chapters, 170 pages, of the high fantasy novel I promised you, which I'm calling A Game of Thrones. When completed, this will be the first volume in what I see as an epic trilogy with the overall title A Song of Ice and Fire. As you know, I don't outline my novels. I find that if I know exactly where a book is going, I lose all interest in writing it. I do, however, have some strong notions as to the overall structure of the story I'm telling and the eventual fate of many of the principal characters in the drama. Roughly speaking, there are three major conflicts set in motion in the chapters enclosed. These will form the major plot threads of the trilogy, intertwining each other in what should be a complex but exciting narrative tapestry. Each of the conflicts presents a major threat to the peace of my imaginary realm, the Seven Kingdoms, and to the lives of my principal characters. The first threat grows from the enmity between the great houses of Lannister and Stark as it plays out in a cycle of plot, counterplot, ambition, murder, and revenge, with the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms as the ultimate prize. This will form the backbone of the first volume of the trilogy, A Game of Thrones. While the Lion of Lannister and the Direwolf of Stark snarl and scrap, however, a second and greater threat takes shape across the narrow sea, where the Dothraki horse lords mass their barbarian hordes for a great invasion of the Seven Kingdoms, led by the fierce and beautiful Daenerys Stormborn, the last of the Targaryen dragon lords. The Dothraki invasion will be the central story of my second book, A Dance with Dragons. The greatest danger of all, however, comes from the north, from the icy wastes beyond the wall, where half-forgotten demons out of legend, the inhuman others raise cold legions of the undead and the neverborn and prepare to ride down on the winds of winter to extinguish everything that we would call life. The only thing that stands between the seven kingdoms and an endless night is the wall and a handful of men in black called the Night's Watch. Their story will be in the heart of my third volume, The Winds of Winter. The final battle will also draw together characters and plot threads left from the first two books and resolve all in one huge climax. The 13 chapters on hand should give you a notion as to my narrative strategy. All three books will feature a complex mosaic of intercutting points of views among various of my large and diverse cast of players. The cast will not always remain the same, old characters will die, and new ones will be introduced. Some of the fatalities will include sympathetic viewpoint characters, I want the readers to feel that no one is ever completely safe, not even the characters who seem to be the heroes. The suspense always ratchets up a notch when you know that any character can die at any time. Five central characters will make it through all three volumes. However, growing from children to adults and changing the world and themselves in the process. In a sense, my trilogy is almost a generational saga, telling the life stories of these five characters. Three men and two women. My five key players are Tyrion Lannister, Daenerys Targaryen, and three of the children of Winterfell, Arya, Bran, and the bastard Jon Snow. All of them are introduced at some length in the chapters you have hand. This is going to be, I hope, quite an epic. Epic in its scale, epic in its actions, and epic in its length. I see all three volumes as big books running about 700 to 800 manuscript pages. So things are just barely getting underway in the 13 chapters I've sent you. I have quite a clear notion of how the story is going to unfold in the first volume, A Game of Thrones. Things will get a lot worse for the poor Starks before they get better, I'm afraid. Lord Eddard Stark and his wife Caitlin Tully are both doomed and will perish at the hands of their enemies. Ned will discover what happened to his friend, John Arryn, but before he can act on his knowledge, King Robert will have an unfortunate accident, and the throne will pass to his sullen and brutal son, Joffrey, still a minor. Joffrey will not be sympathetic, and Ned will be accused of treason, but before he is taken, he will help his wife and his daughter, Arya, escape back to Winterfell. 
Each of the contending families will learn it has a member of dubious loyalty in its midst. Sansa Stark wed to Joffrey Baratheon will bear him a son, the heir to the throne. And when the crunch comes, she will choose her husband and child over her parents and siblings, a choice she will later bitterly rue. Tyrion Lannister, meanwhile, will befriend both Sansa and her sister Arya while growing more and more disenchanted with his own family. Young Bran will come out of his coma after a strange prophetic dream, only to discover that he will never walk again. He will turn to magic, at first in the hope of restoring his legs, but later for its own sake. When his father, Eddard Stark, is executed, Bran will see the shape of doom descending on all of them, but nothing he can say will stop his brother Rob from calling the banners in rebellion. All the North will be inflamed by war, Rob will win several splendid victories and maim Joffrey Baratheon on the battlefield. But in the end, he will not be able to stand against Jaime and Tyrion Lannister and their allies. Rob Stark will die in battle and Tyrion Lannister will besiege and burn Winterfell. Jon Snow, the bastard, will remain in the far North. He will mature into a ranger of great daring and ultimately will succeed his uncle as the commander of the Night's Watch. When Winterfell burns, Caitlin Stark will be forced to flee north with her son Bran and her daughter Arya. Wounded by Lannister riders, they will seek refuge at the Wall. But the men of the Night's Watch give up their families when they take the Black, and Jon and Benjen will not be able to help to Jon's anguish. It will lead to a bitter estrangement between Jon and Bran. Arya will be more forgiving until she realizes with terror that she has fallen in love with Jon who is not only her half-brother, but a man of the Night's Watch, sworn to celibacy. Their passion will continue to torment Jon and Arya throughout the trilogy, until the secret of Jon's true parentage is finally revealed in the last book. Abandoned by the Night's Watch, Caitlin and her children will find their only hope of safety lies even further north, beyond the Wall, where they fall into the hands of Mance Raider, the King Beyond the Wall and get a dreadful glimpse of the inhuman others as they attack the wildling encampment. Bran's magic, Arya's sword needle, and the savagery of their direwolves will help them survive, but their mother Caitlin will die at the hands of the others, which is kind of like her becoming Lady Stoneheart in A Feast for Crows. And back to this chapter, Arya not having any friends would lead her and Jon becoming close. Rob and Joffrey's enmity is also well set up in this chapter, and that's about it for Arya 1, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Bran 2 and continue from there. Now, there are no differences between the HBO TV show and book, because this chapter is almost entirely omitted from the TV show, except for a brief scene introducing the Stark family before the events of Bran 1. However, ironically, the show inversed this original outline with the White Walker threat, coming first in the first three episodes of season 8, while the last three episodes are dedicated to Daenerys' invasion of Westeros. So let's continue on with Bran 2, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,786 words long and is told from the perspective of Bran Stark, the second youngest of the Stark children. In this chapter, Bran is climbing the towers of Winterfell when he discovers Cersei and Jaime Lannister having sex and talking about the danger his father poses. Eventually, he is discovered and Jaime shoves him out the window. This chapter is probably the most consequential event of the book series, considering the implication it has in sending Caitlyn Stark south to start the War of the Five Kings, and sending Bran north to become the Three-Eyed Crow. The majority of the men have gone hunting boar with the king, leaving Bran behind with Jon, Rickon, and the girls. Bran notices that Jon seems to be angry with everyone at the moment, even though he's going to the wall with Uncle Benjen. At first, Bran was excited about leaving Winterfell and going to King's Landing on a real horse, not just a pony. But then he remembers the stories Old Nan told him about ghosts, terrible dungeons and dragon skulls on the walls. He dreams of being a member of the King's Guard someday, and is anxious to meet the greatest living knight, Sir Barristan the Bold. But now Bran is also apprehensive about leaving the only home he has ever known. He will also miss all those he is leaving behind. Bran goes to the Godswood with his direwolf. Unlike his siblings, he still hasn't named his wolf. None of the names he tries seems right. Bran tries and then gives up on trying to teach his wolf to fetch. 
The Woofling was smarter than any of the hounds in his father's kennel, and Bran would have sworn he understood every word that was said to him. Lie down, that's right, now stay. The wolf did as he was told. He was halfway up the tree, moving easily from limb to limb. When the wolf got to his feet and began to howl, Bran looked back down. His wolf fell silent, staring up at him through slitted yellow eyes. A strange chill went through him. He began to climb again. Like, you have to admit, these wolves are creepy and know things. And if someone is controlling Summer right now, then whoever they are knows that Bran is going to fall. Bran spends much of his time climbing the roofs of Winterfell. His mother claims that he could climb before he could walk. Since Bran cannot remember learning to climb or learning to walk, he assumes it must be true. His mother is also terrified that one day he might fall and kill himself. Once Bran kept a promise not to climb for almost a fortnight and was miserable the entire time. Finally, he gave in and confessed his crime the next day. When his father ordered him to the godswood to cleanse himself, they found him sleeping in the tallest tree grove the next morning. His father, angry and laughing, told him that from now on, he was free to climb so long as his mother didn't catch him. Most of the time, they never saw him anyway. People never looked up. That was another thing he liked about climbing. It was almost like being invisible. Ironically, this is what Bran will be doing a lot of as the three-eyed crow. Others have tried to stop him, but to no avail. The guards tried, but they were too slow and escaping from them was fun. Old Nan once told a story of a boy who climbed too high and was struck by lightning and had his eyes eaten by crows. But Bran liked to feed the crows and they never seemed interested in eating his eyes. Maester Lewin made a clay boy and threw it off the wall as an example, but Bran only responded that he is not made of clay and he never falls. Bran is climbing toward the broken tower where only the crows live in Winterfell when he is startled by voices from the first keep, the oldest part of the castle. At first, he doesn't recognize the voices. One voice says the other should be Hand of the King and that Stark will put them in danger because the King loves him like a brother. Jamie jokes that Robert hates his brothers. Unamused, Cersei insists that Robert will listen to Eddard. Jamie states that he prefers honorable men to ambitious men like Littlefinger and Robert's brothers. Cersei says she is worried about what Lysa may have said to the Starks, but Jamie tells her not to worry, as Lysa has no proof. Despite this, Cersei remains fearful that Eddard might betray her son Joffrey when he takes the throne, or convince Robert to put her aside. Bran grows frightened by what he overhears, but wants to see who is talking. So he climbs over the window, then drops down. He can see the man and woman inside, naked, wrestling, and moaning. He recognizes Cersei just as her eyes open, and she sees him. Bran loses his grip as he tries to escape, but he catches himself on the window ledge. Cersei and Jaime come to look at him. Jaime extends a hand to Bran and pulls him onto the ledge. As Bran begins to relax, Jaime asks him how old he is. Bran tells him he is seven. Then Jaime loathingly says, the things I do for love, and shoves Bran backwards out of the window into the empty air. And this is where Bran 2, A Game of Thrones ends. Now onto the theory portion of the video. An interesting thought is that we learn in A Dance with Dragons that Cold Hands and Blood Raven control ravens, but not crows. However, Bran thinks he is the three-eyed crow because all his dreams involve crows. Are you the three-eyed crow? Bran heard himself say, a uh, crow? The Pale Lord's voice was dry. We'll be returning to this idea a lot since Bran seems to have three different kinds of dreams. The wolf dreams, the tree dreams, and the three-eyed crow dreams. If you want to read more about this theory, then click on the form post titled, Blood Raven is not the three-eyed crow. Link is in the description. It is well worth the read. As we go along with this video series, we'll be pointing out that the three-eyed crow might not be Blood Raven. And maybe it was not Blood Raven who sent the direwolves in Bran 1, since he has only been shown to see through werewoods and warg into ravens. Maybe the three eyed crow is an even more powerful greenseer. And this individual might be responsible for turning Euron into the storm crow and sending him dreams of prophecy. Screaming, Bran went backward out the window into empty air. 
there was nothing to grab onto. The courtyard rushed up to meet him. Somewhere off in the distance, a wolf was howling. Crows circled the broken tower, waiting for corn. We propose that the three-eyed crow is the most powerful greenseer ever to live and was responsible for Bran's fall to make him the last greenseer. But for Bran to be the last greenseer, it means no other greenseers can be born after him, which means humanity must go extinct. Euron refers to himself as the last storm in a feast for crows, and we only know of one other powerful greenseer in the story who could be sending Euron apocalyptic visions and be responsible for walking all the whites north of the wall to bring about the long night. And who do the children of the forest call the last greenseer? The last greenseer, the singers called him, but in Bran's dreams, he was still a three-eyed crow. And that's about it for Bran 2, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Tyrion 1 and continue from there. Now, onto the differences between the book and show. In the book, Bran finds Cersei and Jaime are both naked. In the show, they are both dressed. The reason is that Lena Headey was pregnant during filming of the scene, and they used a double. In the book, Cersei and Jaime talk about the previous events that transpired with the former hand, John Arryn. This discussion instead takes place in the scene showing John Arryn's corpse. Jaime pushes Bran from the window with his left hand. In the book, he uses his right hand, which is poetic, since Jamie ends up having his right hand cut off by Vargo Hoat, the leader of the brave companions in A Storm of Swords. So let's continue on with Tyrion 1, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 2,134 words long and is told from the perspective of Tyrion Lannister, the son of Tywin and Joanna Lannister. In this chapter, Tyrion meets up with his nephew Joffrey, and insists he pays his sympathies to the Starks before joining his brother and sister for breakfast, with news that Bran Stark will probably survive his fall. This chapter is mostly designed to introduce the Lannisters with Tyrion as our point of view character until Jaime and Cersei become POV chapters themselves in A Storm of Swords and A Feast for Crows, respectively. Tyrion has been reading all night in Winterfell's library when he hears a wolf howl he gives up on reading, noticing that it's near dawn and that Septon Chael is asleep. Tyrion wakes him and we see Tyrion's deep appreciation for books. Chael, he said softly. The young man jerked up, blinking, confused. I'm off to break my fast. See that you return the books to the shelves. Be gentle with the Valyrian scrolls. The parchment is very dry and quite rare and yours is the only complete copy I've ever seen. Chael gaped at him. Still half asleep, patiently, Tyrion repeated his instructions, then clapped the Septon on the shoulder and left him to his tasks. As he leaves, Tyrion hears Sander Clegane complaining about how long Bran Stark is taking to die. Prince Joffrey states that at least Bran is dying quietly, but the wolf's howling is disturbing his sleep. The Hound offers to go kill it, which Joffrey finds amusing, believing the Starks would not notice it missing. Tyrion notes that the Starks can count past six, unlike some princes. The Hound uses the remark as an excuse to make fun of Tyrion's height. A voice from nowhere, Sandor said. He peered through his helm, looking this way and that. Spirits of the air, the prince laughed, as he always laughed. When his bodyguard did this mummer's farce, Tyrion brushes the comment off before advising Joffrey to pay a visit to the Starks to offer his sympathies. When Joffrey asks what good it would do, Tyrion tells him that his absence has been noticed. Joffrey continues to refuse but Tyrion proceeds to slap him to the edge of tears until the boy acquiesces. The Hound, laughing at Tyrion, warns him that the prince will remember that. Tyrion responds that he hopes he does and that the Hound should be a good dog and remind Joffrey if he forgets it. Tyrion then seeks out his brother and sister who are having breakfast in the morning room of the guest house. He asks if King Robert is still in bed and Cersei disdainfully explains that Robert has been up all night with Lord Eddard and has taken the Starks' sorrow deeply to heart. When Jaime mocks that Robert has a big heart, Tyrion remembers that during his childhood, Jaime was the only person who ever showed him any affection or respect. In return, Tyrion is willing to forgive Jaime for almost anything. Prince Tommen asks after Bran and says he doesn't want him to die. As Tyrion orders breakfast, Jaime comments on the name Brandon being unlucky, but Tyrion states this may not be the case, revealing Maester Lumen thinks that Bran may recover. As he talks, Tyrion catches the significant glance between Jaime and Cersei, 
Why, only that Tommen may get his wish. The maester thinks the boy may yet live. He took a sip of beer. Marcella gave a happy gasp, and Tommen smiled nervously. But it was not the children Tyrion was watching. The glance that passed between? Jaime and Cersei lasted no more than a second, but he did not miss it. Cersei immediately insists it is no mercy for Bran to live. When Marcella asks if Bran will be alright, Tyrion replies that Bran will never walk again. Tyrion goes on to say that the wolf, howling outside his window, may be contributing to Bran's survival. I would swear that wolf of his is keeping the boy alive. The creature is outside his window, day and night, howling. Every time they chase it away, it returns. The maester said they closed the window once to shut out the noise, and Bran seemed to weaken. When they opened it again, his heart beat stronger. Cersei responds that the wolves disturb her and are dangerous, but Jaime tells her the girls' wolves will doubtlessly follow them to King's Landing. Tyrion then reveals to his family that he intends to visit the wall before returning south. Jaime jokes that he hopes Tyrion is not planning to take the black, but Tyrion quips back that if he did, the whores would go begging from dawn to Castle Rock. Cersei leaves abruptly with her children, insisting they shouldn't hear such filth while Jaime wonders if Eddard will leave Winterfell with Bran so ill. Tyrion insists that King Robert will make the choice for Eddard. Jaime declares that if he were Eddard, he would end Bran's torment and save him from being a cripple. Tyrion, himself less than able-bodied, advises Jaime not to say as such in Eddard's presence, before wondering out loud what the tale Bran might say if he wakes up. I hope the boy does wake. I would be most interested to hear what he might have to say. His brother's smile curdled like sour milk. Tyrion, my sweet brother, he said darkly. There are times when you give me cause to wonder whose side you are on. This line from Jamie feels like it might have been left over from George's original 13 chapters, where Jamie was a deplorable villain and would kill his own children, blame the murders on Tyrion, and take the throne. Despite Tyrion proving himself loyal to Jamie by sacking Winterfell, Tyrion replies that Jamie knows how much he loves his family. And this is where Tyrion 1, A Game of Thrones, ends. Now, this chapter is used by Tyrion in A Storm of Swords to wrongly deduce Joffrey's motivation for wanting to kill Bran. He remembered a cold morning when he'd climbed down the steep exterior steps from Winterfell's library to find Prince Joffrey jesting with the Hound about killing wolves. Send a dog to kill a wolf, he said. But the interaction actually went like this. Sandor Clegane's raspering voice drifted up to him, the boy is a long time dying. I wish he would be quicker about it. At least he dies quietly, the prince replied. It's the wolf that makes the noise. I could scarce sleep last night. Clegane cast a long shadow across the hard-packed earth. I could silence the creature, if it please you, he said through his open visor. The notion seemed to delight the prince. Send a dog to kill a dog, he exclaimed. Winterfell is so infested with wolves. The Starks would never miss one. See, Tyrion is misremembering here. Joffrey never wanted to kill Bran, he wanted to kill the wolf. Preston Jacobs has a video called A Song of Ice and Fire, Killing Bran Part 1 and 2, where he explains that it might have been Cersei, Littlefinger, or Mance Raider who sent the cat's paw. Personally, we think it was Mance Raider, since the cat's paw was paid with 90 pieces of silver and Mance travelled to Winterfell to see the king with a loot and a bag of silver. Sending the cat's paw is also an ingenious way to get the Starks and Lannisters warring while Mance begins his invasion south. Rob says he had 90 silver stags in a leather bag, while Mance tells Jon in A Storm of Swords that I took a loot and a bag of silver, scaled the ice near Long Barrow. Anyway, watch Preston Jacob's explanation of this if you're curious. And that's about it for Tyrion 1, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Jon 2 and continue from there. In the meantime, here's the only real difference between the HBO TV show and book. In the book, Tyrion does not sleep in the dog pen. He spends the entire night at the library without sleep. So let's continue on with Jon 2, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 2044 words long and is told from the perspective of Jon Snow after being convinced to join the Night's Watch by Ned. In this chapter, before leaving for the Night's Watch with Benjen and Tyrion, Jon says his last goodbyes, first to the comatose Bran, then to Rob out in the courtyard, and finally to Arya, to whom he gives a Bravosi-type sword. This chapter focuses on the four people, not including Eddard, who probably impacted Jon's life the most at Winterfell. Caitlin, Rob, Arya, and Bran. 
while no attention is paid to John's relationship with Sansa or the baby Rickon. John climbs the stairs to Bran's room with Ghost beside him, fearing that it might be the last time. Caitlin is there, having never left Bran's side for close to a fortnight, which has kept John away. But now, there is no more time. Something cold moves in her eyes. I told you to leave, she said. We don't want you here. Once, that would have sent him running. Once, that might even have made him cry. Now, it only made him angry. He would be a sworn brother of the Night's Watch soon, and face worse dangers than Caitlin Tully Stark. He's my brother, he said. Shall I call the guards? Call them, John said, defiant. You can't stop me from seeing him. He crossed the room, keeping the bed between them, and looked down on Bran, where he lay. John finds Bran withered and shrunken, and asks him not to die. He remembers how much Bran was looking forward to going south. She was holding one of his hands. It looked like a claw. This was not the Bran he remembered. The flesh had all gone from him. His skin stretched tight over bones like sticks. Under the blanket, his legs bent in ways that made John sick. John tells a comatose Bran that everyone is waiting for him to wake up before explaining that he is going north to the wall with Benjen. Caitlin confesses that she wished for Bran to stay home with her, and her wish seems to have been granted. When John attempts to reassure her, she lashes out on him, and, as he is leaving, tells him that it should have been him that fell. John makes the long walk to the yard, where things are in an uproar as the party prepares to leave. Rob brings news that Benjen is looking for John. When Rob asks about his mother, John tells him she was kind. Rob then remarks that the next time they meet, John will be all in black, and they hug farewell. Next, John goes to see Arya, who was repacking her things with help from Nymeria, not having folded them well enough for Scepter Mordain. John says he has a secret present for her to a delighted Arya, who closes the door and sets Nymeria to guard it. John gives her a small sword made specially for her, one like the swords from Bravos. He explains to her that she will have to practice every day, shows her how to hold it, and then gives her her first lesson, stick them with the pointy end. He then warns her not to tell Sansa. Arya runs to him for a last hug. Just before he leaves, John tells Arya that all the best swords have a name. When she asks what her sword's name is, he explains that it's her very favorite thing. Then say the name together, Needle. And this memory warms John on the ride to the wall. And this is where John 2, A Game of Thrones, ends. This chapter shapes the psychology behind Jon Snow as a character through his interactions with Arya, Caitlyn, Rob, and Bran. We also get some potential foreshadowing when Jon tells Arya different roads sometimes lead to the same castle. If Jon does come back to life, then he'll definitely meet Arya again, which will be tragic because neither of them will be the same person that they were when they last saw each other in this chapter. The next person probably most responsible for influencing the Jon story is Caitlyn who is responsible for sending John to the wall and the person John thinks about more than his own lord father when it comes time to accept Stannis' offer to become a Stark. I could be the Lord of Winterfell, my father's heir. It was not Lord Eddard's face he saw floating before him though. It was Lady Caitlin's, with her deep blue eyes and hard cold mouth. She was looking at him the way she used to look at him at Winterfell, whenever he had bested Rob at swords or sums or most anything. Who are you? That look had always seemed to say, this is not your place, why are you here? Ironically, Caitlin might be more responsible for making John honor obsessed than Ned, since we've always interpreted John's obsession with honor as having more to do with proving Caitlin wrong than about getting Ned's approval. Since John thinks about his bastardy all the time and the person most responsible for reminding John of his bastardy would have been Caitlin, not Ned or any of his half siblings. So, we propose if John is the savior of Westeros, it's because of the deep psychological trauma instilled in him by Caitlyn through emotional neglect and a desire to prove her wrong for thinking less of him because he was a bastard. The next most impactful relationship is probably Rob, since John's closeness with Rob is interesting because they are brotherly, but John's entire character comes from living in Rob's shadow, and they both kind of know it without ever acknowledging it. I'm Prince Amon the Dragon Knight, John would call out, and Rob would shout back, well, I'm Florian the Fool, or Rob would say, I'm the young dragon, and John would reply, I'm Sir Ryan Redwine. That morning, he called it first. 
I'm Lord of Winterfell, he cried, as he had a hundred times before. Only this time, this time Rob had answered, You can't be Lord of Winterfell, you're bastard-born. My lady mother says you can't ever be the Lord of Winterfell. Meanwhile, Jon's relationship with Bran, as shown in this chapter, is so pure and innocent that it would be tragic for Jon to find out that Bran tried to stop the Long Night by first building the wall as Bran the Builder, then by sending visions to Aerys Targaryen. That only resulted in him becoming the Mad King before finally travelling all the way back to when the others first appeared, only to be trapped and turned into an other himself, giving the others their power to walk inanimated corpses. So if Jon has to kill the Night King, he has to kill his little brother, and this chapter is the last memory Jon has of him. And that's about it for Jon 2, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Daenerys 2 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are the differences between the HBO TV show and book. The TV series has three additional scenes. The first shows the making of Needle and a conversation between Jamie and Jon, where Jamie ridicules Jon for planning to join the Night's Watch. The second is Cersei visiting Bran's bedroom and speaking to Caitlin about her dead black-haired child. In the book, Cersei tells Ned in Eddard 12 that she never gave birth to any of Robert's children and had an abortion when pregnant with one. Robert was unaware of both the pregnancy and the abortion. In the show, Caitlin is hostile towards Jon when he visits Bran, but not as hostile as she was in the book. Also, Ned appears and Caitlin guilts Ned for leaving when in the books, it was her pushing for Ned to go to King's Landing and investigate John Aaron's murder for the sake of her sister, Lysa, and her son. The third and final additional scene is Ned and John's goodbye, where John asks about his mother, and Ned replies that the next time they see each other, they'll talk about his mother. So let's continue on with Daenerys 2, A Game of Thrones. This chapter is 3,859 words long, and is told from the perspective of Daenerys Stormborn, the younger sister of Viserys and Rhaegar Targaryen. In this chapter, Daenerys Targaryen is married to Khal Drogo in a ceremony that lasts all day and is gifted with dragon eggs and a horse she names Silver. When night falls, Drogo takes Daenerys for a long ride before making love. This chapter introduces Daenerys' dragon dreams, which become a reoccurrence throughout all the books and seem to influence Danny's state of mind and her decisions. But are these dreams truly her own, or are they being sent to her through glass candles? While waiting for her wedding, Illeroy Mopatis explains to Danny that Drogo's Kalisar of 40,000 Dothraki warriors and their families and herds gathered outside the walls of Pentos have made the other Magisters so uneasy they have doubled the city guard. The Dothraki are eating everything in sight, and Illeroy thinks it would be best to have the marriage as soon as possible. Sir Jorah Mormont has offered and been accepted into the service of Viserys, who is impatient for Drogo to help him regain his throne. Illeroy explains to him that the cow must take his new bride to Vais Dothrak first, and then wait until the omens are favourable for war. Viserys complains at the delay, despite Illeroy and Jorah cautioning patience. Sir Jorah, who had travelled as far east as Vais Dothrak, nodded in agreement. I counsel you to be patient, Your Grace. The Dothraki are true to their word, but they do things in their own time. A lesser man may beg a favour from the cow, but must never presume to berate him. Viserys bristled. Guard your tongue, Mormont, or I'll have it out. I am no lesser man. I am the rightful lord of the Seven Kingdoms. The dragon does not beg. Sir Jorah lowered his eyes respectfully. Illeroy smiled enigmatically. There are no more dragons, Danny thought, staring at her brother, though she did not dare say it aloud. That night, Danny dreamed of Viserys, chasing and beating her and saying, You woke the dragon! Then she turns to see a dragon in his place and stares at her. She awakes, terrified and covered in sweat. She had never been so afraid. Until the day of her wedding came at last. But after this dream, Danny learns not to be afraid and actually impresses both the Dothraki and her husband Khal Drogo, which might have been the purpose of the dragon dream. At Drogo and Daenerys' wedding feast, the ceremony begins at dawn and continues until dusk. Viserys, Illeroy, and Jorah are seated below Drogo and Danny at the feast, which grates on Viserys' pride. 
especially when food is first served to Daenerys and Drogo before being offered to him. Daenerys, with the forced smile her brother told her she should wear, eats little since her stomach is upset. She is seated only with her new husband, and they do not even share a common language, so there is nothing for her to do. Early on in the day, she sees Dothraki men taking dancing women and mounting them in the open like animals. When two men grab the same woman, a fight to the death ensues. The survivor then takes another woman, not even the one they'd been fighting over. Illeroy has told her that a Dothraki wedding without at least three deaths is considered dull. By the end of the day, a dozen men have died, obviously making it an exceptional wedding. As the hours passed, the terror grew in Danny until it was all she could do not to scream. She was afraid of the Dothraki, as if they were beasts in human skins and not true men at all. She was afraid of her brother, of what he might do if she failed him. Most of all, she was afraid of what would happen tonight under the stars. But then she reminded herself, I am the blood of the dragon, which is something she might have forgotten if not for the dragon dream. At sunset, Daenerys receives her bride gifts Viserys gives her three handmaids that cost him nothing, picked to teach her what she needs to know. Eri to teach her how to ride, Jiqui to teach her the Dothraki tongue, and Dora to teach her the arts of love. Sir Jorah, with an apology since it was all he could afford, gives her a sack of old books in the common tongue, and she thanks him with all her heart. Illeroy gives her fine silks and fabrics and three huge dragon eggs. One is green, one is cream colored, and one is black with scarlet ripples and swirls. Illeroy tells her that they have turned to stone over the years. Khal Drogo's blood riders give her the traditional three weapons, which she refuses with the traditional refusals and passes to her husband. Many other gifts come from the other Dothraki. Last of all, Drogo brings forward his own bride gift, a fine gray filly. Drogo easily lifts her by the waist up to the saddle. Danny does not know what to do, so Jorah tells her to take the reins and ride. She is only a fair rider, having traveled almost exclusively by other means. But as she rides, she forgets her fears and eventually sends the horse into a gallop and even has it leap over a fire pit, which we suspect Daenerys would not have been able to do without the dragon dream reminding her of who she is, the blood of the dragon. She returns and tells Illeroy to tell her husband that he has given her the wind, and Drogo smiles. Then the sun sets, and Drogo readies his horse. When Viserys warns her to please her husband or she'll regret it, fear comes back to her. Drogo sets a fast pace, saying nothing. Daenerys tries to rid herself of her fear by remembering that she is the blood of the dragon, and the dragon is never afraid. It is full dark when they stop at a grassy place beside a small stream. Drogo swings off his horse and lifts her down from hers. She feels fragile in her wedding silks. She begins to weep, but Drogo says no and wipes her tears away. She asks questions, but all Drogo says is no. He starts softly murmuring to her in Dothraki to soothe her. Drogo sets her down on a rock and sits facing her, then starts removing the bells from his hair and Danny helps. Then he indicates that she should unbraid his hair, which takes a long time. Then Drogo undresses her with tenderness and caresses her until she is ready for him. After he finishes undressing her, he watches her for a while. Then he begins to touch her face and hair. It seems like hours to Daenerys before his hands go to her breasts. This makes Danny breathless. And when he sits her on his lap and asks no, she moves his hand inside her and whispers yes. And this is where Daenerys 2 A Game of Thrones ends. Now with this video series, we'll point out all the times that dreams seem to influence the characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, from Bran and Jon's wolf dreams to Melisandre's visions and so on. Because George dedicates an inordinate amount of time to dreams, and even though it could be argued that they are only meant to be symbolic of what the characters are feeling, we know from Marwyn in Sam 5, A Feast for Crows, that the sorcerers of the Freehold could see across mountains, seas, and deserts with each of these glass candles. They could enter a man's dreams and give him visions and speak to one another, half a world apart, seated before their candles. So Danny's dragon dream might just be a regular dream, 
But it would be interesting if Quaithe or someone else sent this dream to Daenerys so she could bring forth dragons into the world. However, it is also reported that glass candles don't start burning until the arrival of the Red Comet at the end of the Game of Thrones. So maybe glass candles do play a major role in facilitating the different conspiracies going on in A Song of Ice and Fire, but they don't start until the arrival of the Red Comet, in which case Danny's dream is just a dream. But in the meantime, we'll operate under the assumption that the dreams of A Game of Thrones from Bran to Daenerys have been sent by the secret masterminds behind the events of A Song of Ice and Fire. The side of fire wants dragons and the side of ice, we're not sure what they want. Anyway, that's about it for Daenerys 2, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Eddard 2 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the differences between the HBO TV show and book. Danny and Drogo's wedding scene is shown earlier in the TV series than in the book. Jorah is introduced in the scene rather than in Daenerys' first scene where she meets Khal Drogo. In the books, Daenerys' mare is not white but grey, with a mane like silver smoke. Jorah's appearance is different. In the books, he is described as bold, stocky, hairy and unattractive, but is strong and fit. In the series, he has short blonde hair and is leaner and far better looking if that wasn't obvious. In the book, Drogo treats Daenerys affectionately and sensitively. He gently caresses her, asking her no, and waiting patiently until she overcomes her fear, feels ready for the consummation, and tells him yes. In the show, Drogo does not wait for Daenerys to consent to sex, and unlike the book, Daenerys does not seem to take pleasure in it, crying while he takes her from behind. In this chapter, Ned and King Robert discuss the threat posed by Daenerys Targaryen's marriage to Khal Drogo, and the events surrounding the sack of King's Landing, which includes Eddard's suspicions of Jaime Lannister. This chapter was probably designed to foreshadow George's original outline where Jaime would seize the throne by killing his own children and blaming the murders on Tyrion, who would then go on to join the Starks. Ned is woken before dawn to find his horse saddled and King Robert waiting. When the King claims to have urgent matters of state to discuss, Ned invites him to come inside. Robert refuses, claiming that the camp is full of ears. So Ned dresses and mounts up. Robert sets a hard pace, and soon the pair leave the King's Road to ride through the Barrowlands. They do not stop until dawn, miles south of the main party. Exhilarated by the ride, Robert complains of the glacial pace of Cersei's wheelhouse and jokingly suggests that he and Ned run off to live as Vagabond Knights. Ned laughs and reminds Robert of their duties and that they are no longer the boys they once were. Robert jokes that Ned never was the boy he once was, then tries to recall the name of the woman Ned fathered Jon Snow with. Ned provides the name, Wyla, but refuses to say more about her. Robert finally gets the business at hand, a message from the eunuch Varys his master of whisperers in King's Landing. Ned reads the message with trepidation, thinking of Lysa Arryn and her dire accusations, but finds that it concerns the wedding of Daenerys Targaryen to Khal Drogo. When Robert explains that the information has come from Sir Jorah Mormont, Ned takes offence, recalling Mormont as a fugitive who fled the king's justice after selling some poachers to a Tyroshi slaver in defiance of the law. The news of the wedding does not worry Ned, but when Robert angrily suggests an assassination attempt, Ned is not surprised. Since the days of the rebellion, Robert has held a hatred for the Targaryens that seems a madness to him. Ned recalls the angry words that passed between Robert and himself when Tywin Lannister presented Robert with the corpses of Rhaegar Targaryen's wife Elia and children Aegon and Rhaenys as tokens of fealty. Ned called it murder, but Robert called it war. It took the death of Lyanna to reconcile them again. This time, Ned keeps his temper, telling Robert that he is no Tywin Lannister to slaughter innocents. Robert angrily insists that Daenerys will not remain an innocent forever and will soon breed more dragonspawn to plague him. When Ned reiterates that killing a child would be unspeakable, Robert responds, 
that what Ares did to Ned's father and brother and what Rhaegar did to Lyanna were unspeakable. When Robert mentions that Drogo has 100,000 men in his horde, Ned insists that even a million Dothraki are no threat to the realm without ships. Robert replies that ships can be found in the Free Cities and that many in the Seven Kingdoms, particularly in Dawn and the Reach, would not hesitate to join a Targaryen invasion. Despite this, Ned remains convinced that they would be able to drive the Dothraki back, emphasizing the importance of appointing a new Warden of the East. When Robert refuses to appoint John Arryn's son, Robert, Ned suggests the king's brother, Stannis. When Robert continues to be evasive, Ned quickly deduces that he has already promised the office to Jaime Lannister. Ned reminds Robert that Jaime already stands to succeed Tywin as Warden of the West, and that as Warden of both East and West, Jaime would control half of the realm's armies. Ned asks whether Jaime can be trusted. When Robert asks why he shouldn't trust Jaime, Ned reminds him that Jaime betrayed and killed the last king he was sworn to protect. To illustrate his point about Jaime Lannister, Ned describes to Robert how after the Battle of the Trident, he followed Rhaegar's army back to King's Landing to find the city sacked by the Lannisters. Ned goes on to explain that upon entering the throne room, he found King Aerys dead on the floor and Jaime sitting on the Iron Throne. Although Jaime eventually rose to say that he was only keeping the uncomfortable thing warm for Robert, Ned insists that Jaime had no right to sit on the throne. Robert finds this amusing and does not consider Jamie's great sin to be that bad. He gallops off, but Ned pauses, realizing that his place is in Winterfell, with his wife and Bran, since Robert will always do what he pleases. Ned becomes resigned to his predicament and follows Robert, and this is where Eddard II, A Game of Thrones, ends. This chapter was most likely included in George R. R. Martin's original 13 chapter outline from 1993, since it feels as though the chapter is foreshadowing Jaime becoming king of Westeros by killing all those who stand in his way. As George wrote in his outline, Tyrion Lannister will continue to travel, to plot, and to play the Game of Thrones, finally removing his nephew, Joffrey, in disgust at the boy king's brutality. Jaime Lannister will follow Joffrey on the throne of the Seven Kingdoms. By the simple exentment of killing everyone ahead of him in the line of succession and blaming his brother Tyrion for the murders. If this is what was meant to happen, then Eddard's warning to Robert seems very prudent. But as it stands, Eddard's assessment of Jaime's character couldn't have been more wrong and the title of Warden of the East has not even been mentioned in A Feast for Crows or A Dance with Dragons, despite the early importance placed on it in the story. Instead, Tyrion's assessment of Jaime is more apt when he tells Aegon that my brother Jaime thirsts for battle, not for power. He's run from every chance he's had to rule. Next, this chapter has Ned and Robert's discussion take place in the Barrowlands, which seems to be a place of great importance to the story. Ned pointed them out to his king, the Barrows of the First Men. Robert frowned, have we ridden onto a graveyard? There are barrows everywhere in the north, your grace, Ned told him. This land is old. In A Dance with Dragons, the story again lingers in the Barrow Lands, with Theon, the grassy slopes of the Great Barrow. Some claimed it was the grave of the first king, who had led the first men to Westeros. Others argued that it must be some king of the giants, who was buried there to account for its size. Moreover, in the world of ice and fire, the chapter dedicated to the north talks about the Barrow's land more than all other northern houses combined, except for House Stark, which again seems to indicate Barrow's Town's importance to the story. Barrow's Town, too, is somewhat of a curiosity, a gathering place built at the foot of the reputed Barrow of the First King, who once ruled supreme over all the First Men. It could be that the Barrow Kings ruled the North before the Long Night, since they seem to be the oldest house in the North, as indicated by their sigil, the rusted crown upon the arms of House Dustin derives from their claim that they are themselves descended from the first king and the Barrow kings who ruled after him. But then, after the long night, the White Walker invasion was stopped at Winterfell, and the Starks built their castle on top of where Winter fell and became the Kings of Winter, 
more historical proof exists for the war between the kings of winter and the barrow kings to their south who styled themselves the kings of the first men and claimed supremacy over all first men everywhere even the starks themselves runic records suggest that their struggle dubbed the thousand years war by the singers was actually a series of wars that lasted closer to 200 years than a thousand ending when the last barrow king bent his knee to the king of winter and then gave him the hand of his daughter in marriage lastly the barrow kings are buried in barrows while the starks are buried in the winterfell crypts Maybe after the war with the others, the Starks wanted to prevent their spirits from entering the Weirwood net by encasting themselves in stone crypts. That king is missing his sword, Lady Dustin observed. It was true. Theon did not recall which king it was, but the long sword he should have held was gone. The sight disquieted him. He had always heard that the iron in the sword kept the spirits of the dead locked within their tombs. If a sword was missing, then the children of the forest can maybe access the Starks' memories and their secrets. Anyway, that's about it for Eddard 2, A Game of Thrones. In the next video, we'll cover Tyrion 2 and continue from there. In the meantime, here are some of the differences between the HBO TV show and book. In the book, Robert's and Eddard's conversation about Daenerys takes place during the writing. In the show, it takes place at breakfast. In the book, Jorah is revealed to the reader as an informer during Robert and Ned's discussion in the chapter, while in the show, Jorah is first mentioned to be an informant looking for a pardon in episode 5 during a small council meeting. Anyway, that's it for today's episode. If you want to see more of A Song of Ice and Fire Explained, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flight's A Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition.